Well, today I want to share lessons from David in a time when he struggled with discouragement. Let me set it up for you. We're we're in this series, uh, Running on Empty, and this is a time that David was truly running. David was anointed by Samuel as king of Israel, but there was only one problem. Israel already had a king. His name was Saul. Well, for a while, David and Saul got along, but when David killed the giant Goliath and started becoming more popular than Saul, well, Saul decided it was time to kill him. So in the passage that we look at today, David was on the run, and we actually find him hiding in a cave. 1 Samuel 22, 1 says, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. And you might think this is a, a sweet family moment, David's father and his brothers joining him in the cave, but they weren't there to offer support. They were there to avoid being killed themselves because they were associated with David. They felt like they'd be next. So David's family was with him and all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. Now David had to kind of feel a little bit ripped off, don't you think? Because David was supposed to be on a throne in the palace, leading powerful warriors. And instead, David is hiding in a dark cave surrounded by the biggest losers in Israel. See, David looked around that cave and wondered, how in the world did I ever end up with these guys? I mean, where did I go wrong? This can't be God's plan for my life. I mean, you can imagine the emotions that he dealt with. He certainly dealt with fear because he was wondering, is Saul going to find me here in this cave? Am I going to be next? Am I going to be killed any day now? He dealt with rage, thinking about, I killed Goliath and saved God's people, and this is the thanks I get. He dealt with rejection, not just from people, but thinking, God, have you turned your back on me? Do you even know where I am? Why aren't you working in my life? There was so much confusion for David as he wondered, what do I do now? How do I move forward from here? And maybe you identify with David. Now, your cave is not a literal cave, but like David, you are in a cave of discouragement, despair, and defeat. Now, you you have people around you that mean well, and they tell you, listen, I know it's rough, but if you'll just be happy, If you'll just deal with it, if you'll just get over it, well, that sounds real good when you say it, but when you're the one struggling, you don't know how to deal with it. You don't know how to just get over it. You want to be happy, but it's not that easy. So what do you do in those times? Well, here's what I think happened. David went to the back of the cave by himself sat down on a rock, and he started to write in his journal. And boy, this entry was going to be one scorching entry. God was going to get an earful as he told him what he thought about the situation. But suddenly, in the midst of that dark cave, David sensed and felt the presence of the Lord. And then David did what he always did in times of great emotion. He wrote a song. Now, I know a lot of people turn to music when they're kind of feeling down, but it's interesting. They don't always choose songs that would cheer them up. Instead, they sit down and they listen to sad songs. They listen to songs like, rainy days and Mondays always get me down, (laughs) or I'm so lonesome I could cry. Or maybe they pull out some vintage George Jones. He stopped loving her today. Pretty much you could insert any country song there and it would probably fit. But even though songs like that might have fit the moment that David was in, David's song turned out quite different. Scholars believe he wrote Psalm 34 while he was in that cave. And I want to look at David's cave song, and I want to share with you some decisions to make, some principles to remember, and most importantly, some promises of God that will help you make it through discouragement. Now, we're going to move very quickly through the entire passage. You've got the notes, so here we go. Now, I want you to picture the moment. David sitting down on a rock in the back of a dark cave, and he began to sing. I will extol 
Now, extol is kind of a King James word. We don't really use that very often. A better word is bless. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. That's not what you expect the opening line of David's song to be, because you expect David to kind of be angry with God. But David looked around and he made up his mind, I am going to praise God even in a cave surrounded by losers, even on the run. I will not allow circumstances to change my mind about God. I will bless the Lord in the bad times as well as the good times. I will bless the Lord at all times. And you hear that and you say, come on, Brian, I can't praise God. Not now. You don't know what the doctor said. Or you don't understand. I've been hurt. I can't praise God. Not in this condition. Not when I feel like this. Well, David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. And with those words, David sent a message of trust to God, a message of defiance to the enemy, and a message of hope to every person in that cave with him. So you need to make the same decision. Choose to praise God regardless of your circumstances. You need to lift your hands, lift your voice, and sing. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Another version says magnify. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. You see, it's such a temptation when things start going wrong. People drop out of ministry. They say, oh, Pastor Tracy, I love the choir. I'm enjoying it, but there's just so much going on in my life right now. I need to pull back, and and you'll see me again, I hope, but, but right now I need to step back. See, in their mind, the thought is, well, if things aren't going exactly as I planned, well, then I sure can't minister or lead. Well, David did exactly the opposite. David said, hey, You guys, get over here and rejoice. Magnify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together. See, the other guys in the cave had to think David was absolutely crazy because it sure didn't seem like the right time to sing. But David refused to allow those negative circumstances to keep him from leading others to the presence of God. So you need to make that same decision. Even when I am in the cave... I will keep leading. You know, Pastor Rod shared a story with me once about how our former pastor, Pastor Garrison, told him in a, in a particularly challenging season of our church. He said, Rod, anyone can lead a ship in the harbor. We trained to do this, to lead the ship through a storm. See, leaders lead. So don't quit. Don't drop out simply because you're feeling bad. Even when you're in a cave, lead. Verse four, David said, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. See, David sang about deliverance even while hiding in a cave because David understood the circumstances are in God's hands. God is in control. See, David's circumstances hadn't changed. He was still in the cave. He was still being hunted by Saul. But David declared the goodness of the Lord. In a moment of supernatural strength, David's fear was replaced by confidence in God. David knew the strength of his God, and David had a promise. God will deliver me from my fear. Isn't that an awesome promise? That even when you feel overwhelmed by those emotions, that that fear will not stay for long. God will deliver you from that fear. Verse 5, David said, Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. That's an amazing truth. See, if you only look at your circumstances, it's easy to get pretty down on yourself. You start to decide, "Eh, I'm a loser. I'll never do anything right. Anyone who's failed at relationships as much as me must be flawed. Well, I'm just stupid. I'm worthless. Now, that doesn't sound very radiant, does it? (laughs) But see, David was surrounded by some low self-esteem guys. And you got to remember how they were described earlier. He said, all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented. Now, these were all 
guys who had failed. And David looked at them and he said, if you look to God, you can deal with the shame. You can, be, you can overcome that, that poor self-esteem that has surrounded you. In fact, your face will be radiant. See, when you're in the cave, you got to remember this principle. Your self-worth is determined by your relationship with God, not by your circumstances. See, circumstances come and go. Bad things happen to everyone. Failure is a part of life. But listen to me. You are not defined by what is currently going on in your life. Your value is not established by your circumstances. Your value was determined long ago on the hill of Calvary when Jesus paid the price for your soul. God cares about you and you matter to him. Oh, but David kept singing. He said, this poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his trouble. See, David was talking himself and all those around him into a better feeling. He started singing about someone who received deliverance from the Lord. And David said, look at God's history, would you? Another guy without hope called out to God and God heard him. See, when you're in a difficult time, you got to quit speaking words of gloom and despair. Instead, look at what God has done in the past. He is the same God, and he can and will do it again. Make the decision to speak encouraging words of faith and trust. Even when you feel overwhelmed by that emotion, speak encouraging words of faith and trust. Oh, uh-oh, Brian. Are you preaching positive confession that whatever you say you can have? Well, no, I'm not preaching positive confession, but I'll tell you this, I like it better than negative confession. So you speak positively with words of faith, and when you do, you encourage yourself with your words. See, negative speech only deepens your depression. But David made a very important choice. In the midst of his worst moment, he penned these words as an encouraging song, not just to God, but to himself. And David said in verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers him. See, suddenly David's perspective of the situation changed. See, David wasn't just surrounded by losers. David was also surrounded by the angels of the Lord. God was with him. See, when you're in the cave, you convince yourself that you're all alone, that nobody understands. I've got news for you. If you could just see in a different realm, you would understand that the angels of the Lord are all around you. This isn't going to last forever because you are not alone in the cave. God is with you. Verse, six, or verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. See, David didn't want the guys around him to get focused on the safety of the cave. David knew one day soon they were going to have to get out of the cave. Because David's destiny wasn't the cave. David was destined to be king. So David reminded the men, remember where your safety comes from. Remember who we run to. He was teaching a principle. God is our refuge, not the cave. See, sometimes when you're discouraged, you retreat into a cave of depression. You shut out others. You even choose to shut out God. You stay home from church. You don't answer the phone. You don't return messages. You hide in the cave. Listen, that cave is not your refuge. God is. So run out of the cave and run to God. Oh, but what will people think if I'm depressed in church? Well, they'll think you're in the right place because God is your refuge. And in his presence, there is fullness of joy. David said in verse 9, fear the Lord, you his saints. That kind of makes me laugh because you really think those guys he was talking to were saints? He said, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Now, this was an amazing statement because David wrote this when he didn't even have a pillow to lay his head on. In the midst of nothing, David was declaring that those who seek the Lord lack nothing. David was able to say that because he had a promise. God will meet all your needs. And you have that same promise. Your heavenly father is watching out for you. 
The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. The lions David's talking about was the enemy. He's talking about Saul and his army who were pursuing not only him, but everybody else that was with him in the cave. And he said, hey, they will get tired and run out of food, but we won't because we seek the Lord. He is our source. Listen, God is your source. Your job is not your source. Your boss is not your source. That man is not your source. Your position or paycheck is not your source. God is your source. So when you get discouraged because it seems like there's no way out, you got to remember, God has unlimited supply. Verse 11 says, come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. See, David served notice to the men in the cave. Now, I'm sure those guys had a lot to say about Saul, politics, the current state of the kingdom. But I don't know if David was, was threatening them or just teaching a principle. But let me, let me read that same section with just a slightly different emphasis. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. If you want to see many good days, don't speak evil and don't lie. In other words, shut up or die. (laughs) Now, that might be an effective way to handle gossips and liars, you think? If you want to live, quit it. That would solve a lot of church problems, wouldn't it? Perhaps that could be our insult in the bulletin that week. It might might, might fit. But David decided no matter how far down he was, no matter his feelings about Saul, and I promise you he had them, he wasn't going to pollute his mind and his spirit by listening to negative people. And that's the decision you need to make. Refuse to listen to negative people. Because negative people are often attracted to those who are discouraged or depressed because they know that they're going to probably find a listening ear, someone who will let them spew that garbage. So you don't do that. Be wise. Listening to people spew their negativity, criticism, and gossip will keep you in a cycle of frustration and despair. Because I have never met the person who said, you know, I was feeling horrible until people started saying horrible things to me. And then I felt better. No, if you hang around with with negative gossips, they're going to keep you in that cave. Hey, they make me discouraged on a good day, much less a bad day. So choose not to listen to negative people. Verse 14, turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. You know, in the cave, David and his men, they had a choice to make. They could focus on Saul and trying to destroy him, or they could focus on peace instead of their enemies. See, even though bad was happening to him, David's focus was on doing good. And you have the same choice. You have to choose, because chances are there's someone you can blame. Somebody made a bad decision. Someone did wrong. Someone said something they shouldn't have, and now you are paying the price for it. But you get to choose. You get to choose. Are you going to focus on the person? Are you going to be enemy-oriented? Or are you going to choose to be like David and pursue peace? See, when your eyes are on your enemy, it's hard to keep your eyes on God and his plan for your life. So make the choice to take your eyes off the enemy and place your eyes on Jesus. Now, I want want you to look at where his eyes are. Verse 15 says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. See, David reminded the men in the cave, God knows exactly where you are and he hears our prayers. Maybe you found yourself in the midst of a a cave of discouragement and you were half yelling, half praying, God, where are you? Do you even hear me? Do you know what's going on in my life? Are you ever going to respond to my prayer? Listen, God knows where you are. He has not abandoned you. He has not forgotten you. 
It seems dark and lonely in the cave, but God's watching over you and he hears your prayers. You know, mothers have a special gift. Have you ever noticed this? If you've been on a a playground where there's like hundreds of kids playing and running around, I mean, it's like chaos and loud noises. But if one child falls and scrapes their knee and begins to cry out, their mother, who's on the other side of the playground, hears among all the noise, they recognize the cry of their child and they come running to rescue them. Listen, that's how God is. He is tuned in to the sound of your voice. He hears your cries. He hears your prayers. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Now, I love this point. Because if you're in a cave because of someone else, if you're, if you're facing an enemy, this should encourage you big time. God is on your side. And you wonder, well, man, will I, will I be haunted by these allegations forever? Uh, will, 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 will these lies ever quit? Listen, God's not only going to handle it for you, but people won't even remember that your enemies existed. Look at it again. It says, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth to which we all respond. Hey, yeah, go get them, God. Start now, please. Verse 17 says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Can you hear something loud and clear this morning? It's okay to cry. Cry to the Lord when you feel overwhelmed. It is not a sign of weakness. In fact, God is attracted to your cry. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So if you're brokenhearted, if you feel like your heart has just been torn in two and you feel like your spirit is completely crushed, the Lord's close to you. David may never have learned that lesson without first going through the cave. See, what a powerful principle. Your time in the cave has a purpose. See, in times of trouble, that's when you discover just how much you really need God. In times of uncertainty, you develop a radical dependence on him. Your cave time has a purpose. It's while you're in the cave that you're going to learn to trust in him fully and completely. Now, does that mean God caused your situation? Absolutely not. But in the cave, you will learn about his faithfulness, his love, and your need for him. Verse 19, a righteous man may have many troubles. Now, I have to be honest with you. This is a truth I don't get that excited about. (laughs) And some people have even tried to pretend like this particular verse isn't in the Bible. They want you to believe that if you love God, well, you will never have a problem and things will always go your way. Their thought is, well, a righteous man shouldn't have any troubles. Well, that's not true. Just because you have a problem, that doesn't mean you are out of God's will. You got to ignore the pompous, self-righteous people who try to tell you that if you're having a problem, you must have sin in your life. Well, David said, a righteous man may have many troubles. See, part of pursuing God is learning how to overcome difficulties. David had them. Paul had them. Jesus had them. And you will too. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. It's a guarantee. David said, a righteous man may have many troubles. And I'll admit, that's kind of discouraging by itself. But look at the next part. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. That is awesome. And I like that part a little bit better because you may be in a cave, but deliverance is coming. You may have gotten a bad report from the doctor, but healing is on the way. You may not see how you'll ever make it back financially, but God, your supernatural source, is more than enough to meet all your needs. Good news, you are about to be delivered. You may have many financial troubles, but God will deliver you from them all. You may not think that you'll ever make it through this depression, but God will deliver you. 
And you may be stuck in a foreign country with no way out, but we learned this week, God will deliver you. Hallelujah. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. That is a good verse to memorize. You ought to quote that to yourself every time you find your moment in a cave of discouragement. Verse 20 says, he protects all his bones, not one of them will be broken. Isn't that awesome? You're going to come out of the cave, yes, but you're not going to come out hobbling and limping and wondering what's going on. You're going to come out whole, intact, and restored. Your troubles aren't going to defeat you. Instead, you're going to defeat your troubles because you have a promise. God will protect you fully and completely. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. Your parents said it like this, what goes around comes around. Yeah. See, David said, you don't have to kill the wicked because their evil ways will turn around and do it for you. You don't have to attack your enemies because right will ultimately prevail. You don't have to chase down every lie that a liar tells about you. Their lies will trip themselves up. Your enemies will be scattered and you're going to come out of this without even fighting the battle. That's an awesome promise. Your enemies will self-destruct. Some of you make the mistake of trying to get down to the level of those that are fighting against you and you try to fight the same way that they are. That is a mistake. Instead, you don't have to obsess about and fight your enemies. Their own evil will do it for you. God is on your side. Now, this psalm of David that he wrote in a dark, gloomy, lonely cave ends with such a powerful verse. He says, the Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. That's the promise. God will see you through. See, you've been in that cave long enough. It's time to come out of the cave. But here's a, here's a key question. Are you going to face it and try to handle it without him and do it on your own? In your time of discouragement, are you going to throw a pity party and wallow in self-pity and, and in all your troubles? Or are you going to choose to be like David and say, I will bless the Lord at all times. On my good days, I will bless the Lord. On my bad days, I will bless the Lord. You have got to choose to put your trust and your confidence in your God who has promised to deliver you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment? Because I know in this room and watching online, there are many who identify with David and you're in a cave of discouragement and difficulty. Maybe you're even in a season of despondency and despair. Depression has seemed to overtake your life and you just don't see a way out. The Lord is speaking strongly to you. I know where you are. I know how you feel. And I'm right there with you. The angels of the Lord are surrounding you. He is sending his ministering angels to give you exactly what you need in this very moment.